So a little bit of background on me. I'm Aaron Quill. I work for Sousa Rancher. I'm a cloud native and Kubernetes specialist for them. I live in San Diego, California, so that's normally what I get to see on a Friday night. Um, I have done a ton of different things in computers. Uh, I've done technology evangelism for a while. I was a PM over a variety of uh, security products and directory products. Um, I am a home automation fanatic, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes, because we're going to kind of hit on that. And outside of that, yeah, I'm over 50 and I still skateboard almost every day. And I have worked and traveled to over 50 countries, um, which has just been awesome. This is young Aaron, man. This is me probably about 1981. This is my first computer. That is a TI-99-4A. Anyone, you had one, you know what one is? I had one and I had the awesome expansion box. I had the TI-99 and I upgraded to the 4A so that I could have 4K, right? Because I, this was actually, back here is when I thought I wanted to be a programmer, right? Because I just discovered computers, I wanted to learn everything about them. I wrote my first computer game on this, I wrote two thirds of my first computer game on this, and I ran out of memory ran out of the 4K, and I was like, I am done. I no longer want to program. Now, here's the funny thing. That computer was very cool, right? The reason why this was so cool, all your friends had those crappy VIC-20s, right? What was cool about this, this had a 16-bit processor in it, right? And had 4K of RAM, and was a blazing 1.3, I'm sorry, 0.136 MIPS. I gotta tell you how long it took me to find that actual speed because Aaron the idiot was searching for MIPS. It didn't do MIPS, it did instructions per second, right? Cool, so 1.36 MIPS. Now, like I said, I am a home automation fanatic, right? Anybody here do home automation, right? Anybody have these cool little Shelly devices in their wall sockets, right? So I have these all throughout the house. They replace my wall sockets, give you Bluetooth, give you Wi-Fi, give you a web server. That is 200 MIPS, right? There's a lot of math in between what I started on and what we're currently working on. Now, just for comparison, like I said, I do just about everything on Kubernetes at the house, so that's a Raspberry Pi 4. A Raspberry Pi 4 does about 2,000 MIPS. Of course, I run Kubernetes on it, so I have four of those boards running, so I have access to 8,000 MIPS at home, which is just, for me, that just blows my mind, just what I've seen in my lifetime of going from what I had in the computer now just being blown away by wall sockets and, you know, computers that are the size of a deck of cards. But this ran into a problem, right? We had young Aaron at 81, in 1981 running out of the power and processing and memory of his computer. So what did Aaron do? Aaron looked to use other people's computers, right? And so in the early 80s, I was a computer hacker. Right? and did anything I could to access other people's computers. Now, the cool thing is, at that time, it wasn't about taking money. It wasn't about shutting people down. More than anything, it was a bunch of kids trying to learn stuff. Right? We really just wanted access. You know, we were breaking into places so that we could read the manuals on the operating systems. Right? It was things like that. We were just after knowledge. In fact, if you want to know how serious of a computer hacker I was, My 15th birthday, my super secret computer hacker name, Sir Brockulot, is on the giant cookie, right? So think of how lucky I am right now that the FBI didn't have access to the great cookie com company's database in uh, North Polk Mall, right? I'm incredibly lucky. Now we couldn't get away with this. Um, it was the dark ages for computer hacking back there because we didn't do anything, right? We didn't have connectivity. We had to dial up, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have anything like that. All that has radically changed now, right? The problem is now, we're no longer worrying about kids like Aaron, that you know, there were so few of us that even had access to computers back then, that now we have people all over the world, right? All different backgrounds, some of them sponsored by governments, some of them looking for cash, some of them looking to lock up your data to hold it for ransom. We have people all over the place hitting and trying to get access to our data. Um, <laughs> And then we have incredible services out there to help them. Andrew, I don't know if you've seen this one or not. This is one I've been meaning to tell you about. Has anybody seen Shodan before? 
Yeah, it lets you go out and look for, inner, for IoT devices, right? And find them and find what ports they've got open and all sorts of cool things you can do with them. Now, that's only one of them. There are a ton of these. Here's another one that I like called ZoomEye, which lets you search for things based on protocols, right? Or, oh, I skipped it. Sorry, let me jump back. Uh, Census lets you search based on IP address and ports and all sorts of amazing things. So now, for me, all the tough stuff we used to do is now bloody automated for the kids, right? So the problem is we have people able to find our open systems. So not only that, uh, just, this is just like the three latest articles that I've read. Probably a lot of you guys have seen them. I don't know if you see, this was a great one that was just saying, look, your entire Kubernetes system and cluster is vulnerable if you have a single misconfigured YAML, right? If somebody can get access to it, they can take over your entire system. Here was another one that was just three days ago, and this is a new problem. Did you guys patch your clusters yet? A, a new thing with an ingress controller, where if you have an unpatched ingress controller, we can get access to etcd and your cluster, which we'll talk about what that means in just a second. And then here's one that just really makes me cry because I thought I was done with Windows, right? And one of the things that kills me is I've been doing Linux and Kubernetes, well, Linux for probably 20 years, Kubernetes from about when it started, and I've avoided Windows this entire time. Now, not only do I have to worry about Windows with Kubernetes, I'm back to worrying about Windows vulnerabilities. Um, this talk was at KubeCon China last month. Lucky, I was lucky enough to be there and got to uh, met Louis. Uh, this was just posted uh, to YouTube last week. They finally posted all the Chinese uh, KubeCons last week. He is releasing a cool utility that if you have compromised Kubernetes, like we just talked about with that ingress, you can go in and modify the etcd database in some very cool ways. Now again, I'm gonna show my age here, but does anybody remember something we used to do called Escape 255, right? One of our favorite things to do is when we would compromise the system, you go create a new user, and for the username, you put in Escape 255. Anybody remember what that is? It's a space without a carriage return, right? So what winds up is you get a user name that's blank, that people don't even notice in the UI that there's a username there. What's funny is, like I said, that's something we were doing in the 80s all the time. You always do Escape 255. It was hilarious to see this talk because he's literally doing the exact same thing. He's given you the ability to go into etcd and create a namespace with a space and a totally blank name so it doesn't appear, right? So now you can have hidden namespaces that people can't see. All sorts of cool stuff, go look at his talk. It's again, this is the problem. We took advantage of your system, we compromised it through a bad YAML or ingress or whatever, now we can do nefarious things to it. Um, customers are worried about this, right? This is CNCF, this is 2000 and, or, I'm sorry, this is 22, so just last year, 44% of people that want to roll out containers haven't rolled them out because of security, right? That's a huge concern, we need to stop this. 97% of customers that they surveyed said that Kubernetes uh, security is hard, right? And I swear 3% did not thoroughly understand the question or they're being lied to by their staff, right? But, but I mean, that's the honest to God truth. It's, no man, there's so many working parts, there's, we, we really have to worry about security here. And of course, another thing, biggest concern is security policy. So what do we do? The answer, of course, is what's the answer to everything in Kubernetes, right? It's as code, right? Or it's not just Kubernetes, it's what we've learned in cloud native. It's as code is the way to go. And why do we want it as code? It's because as soon as we start to treat things as code, it's reproducible, right? We know that every time we run it, it's gonna run the exact same way. It's testable, it's scalable, and it's auditable. And what do we mean by that? It's sitting in a Git repo, right? We can see all the changes that people are making. We can check out a copy, we can test against it. We can do everything, right? So now we need a policy platform. What do we need a policy platform to do? We need somewhere to write and store all those policies. 
we then need the system to be able to evaluate those policies and make those judgment calls. Should I allow this to happen? Should I not allow it to happen? Should I mutate this object before we spin it up or what have you? And then the other key thing to this whole thing is to constantly monitoring, right? You're monitoring not just to make sure that people are compliant with your policies, but what happens when something's not compliant with the policy? And all of a sudden, you get a whole bunch of alerts, right? You want to not just have your system board turned red, you want to be able to act on those alerts. Now, as soon as we start to talk about writing stuff, what do we get into? The argument that people have been having for 50 years now, what language am I going to code it in? Right? And that's really the problem. We want as many people working on security as possible, because we have as many nefarious people as possible trying to get access to our system. So what we need to do is make security not only accessible so that anybody in our uh, company or whatever can write security policies, but we also want it so that everybody can understand them and read them and they're logical and what have. But we run into this thing, which is everybody likes a different programming language. And everybody has different comfort levels at a different programming language. So what we really want to do is we need the ability to adopt to what, however people are comfortable coding, right? I've got a person here that's in DevOps. Bob, he's familiar with Go and Rego. That's great. He's in DevOps, especially with Rego. That's going to help us with some of our policy stuff, right? But the problem is we also have Alice, who's one of our top developers. She doesn't do Rego. Rego's so specific to Kubernetes and policies. Why would she know that? Right? She knows Go, she knows Rust, right? We've got the same thing with our uh, DevSecOps person, codes in a couple different languages. What we want to be able to do is we need to get security knowledge from all of these people and be able to teach it to our policy system. And it's not only that about what um, language they're comfortable in coding in, different languages are more efficient at doing different things. So here we've got a couple different tasks. You know, we might want to uh, validate a service. We w might want to, in fact, this is one of my favorite things, right? Create a policy to make sure that any container that's going to spin up is on a full signed image so we don't have, you know, code sliding in that we don't know about. You know, lock down the cluster so that it can only have signed containers. Um, we get here to where we want to do some validation in labels. You, you, you could write that in Go. Um, but you're going to have to throw some libraries in and, and stuff, and it's going to be a little bit of work to use labels where, in that case, it would probably be a lot more efficient to write it in Rego because you're going to be using native uh, Kubernetes uh, labels. Now, what about preventing uh, SSH leaks? Oh my god, how many libraries are there for that? Right? People have already done the work for that. So, in that case, if I'm writing something there, I'm probably going to write it in Go or C Sharp or something where I'm just going to be able to go steal somebody's library that already is going to check to see if there's SSH keys leaking or whatever. So that's the cool thing is it's not just taking advantage of what people can develop in, but really picking the proper language based on what your task is. And that's really where Cubewarden comes in, right? Cubewarden's goal is to be a universal uh, policy platform. How am I doing on time, by the way? Cool. When are we over? I should have asked this before, huh? Ten after. Ten after. Cool. No problem at all. We're going to be, we're going to be great. Right. So, what is Cube Warden? Cube Warden is an open source project that we created at Rancher, but now we have donated it to the CNCF. So, it's a CNCF uh, sandbox project. Yay! Cool. It's BYO programming skills, right? Whatever you're comfortable in, right now. These are the four languages that we've got the SDK in that we're really promoting. But if you go to the Cube Warden site, we are just looking for people to say, hey, can you help do the SDK in this language? Right? We're really looking for feedback from people. But right now, these have kind of been the four that people are jumping on. So if you code in this language, it's killer. You're going to be able to do stuff with uh, Cube Warden. Or if you know some domain-specific programming. So right now, we totally support Rego, and of course, what's going on with OPA, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And we are working on the ability to do uh, Caverno and uh, Google's uh, Cell. So those are coming uh, fairly soon. So the cool thing is, again, best tool for the job. You've already got a bunch of stuff written in Rego, awesome. You've already got stuff in all that other stuff, doesn't, great. It doesn't matter. We can go ahead and leverage it and take advantage of it. 
So how do we make all this work? That's why I was laughing. I just walked in and like, I saw a lot of you guys were here in the previous session. I walked in at the end of the last session. I was like, man, this is awesome. It's going to make my session a lot easier because he's talking about WebAssembly, right? How do we make this whole thing work that you get to code in whatever language you want? It's WebAssembly, right? So I get the ability to code in whatever language I want. We then build it, compile it using a WebAssembly compiler, and all of a sudden, we can run on whatever we want. This is technology that came out uh, in 2019, and it was really for browsers, right? In fact, what was cool is one of the first things that I saw, actually, the first thing that I saw was Space Invaders, because somebody ported Space Invaders that you could plug into a browser as kind of a proof of concept, which was awesome. But then, I love this. They took the source code for AutoCAD, right? AutoCAD did this, no one nefarious, took the source code for AutoCAD, all they had to do was fire up their compiler and save it as WebAssembly. So now what happens? That's why all of a sudden, about three years ago, we were able to do AutoCAD in a browser now. And it's not that crappy stuff. It's like full-blown uh, AutoCAD running in the browser. And that's really what's given us. It's given us this ability to do portable apps that truly are cross-platform and everything. So what did we do? We're using the exact same technology, but we're sliding Kubernetes in there, right? So we're taking advantage of WebAssembly. It gives us the ability to now write your policy in anything you want, right? Well, in these four languages, as long as that contains everything. Um, compile it, and then we can run it on your cluster. Doesn't matter what the platform is. Again, we get all that cross-platform stuff so, so that all of a sudden now that we're supporting ARM and we're supporting x86, and now we're supporting Windows, right? That's the cool thing is all those policies uh, can work on all the different platforms. And what is cool, as far as security goes, it's like a container running down on the machine, right? So we've got nice security. There are a couple things done um, uh, specifically to make it secure. It is complete in a isolated runtime, right? So we've got it over there. It's running in a Linux container, and each one is in their own runtime. So we don't have to worry about security nearly as much. You can think of them each as tiny little VMs that are just doing a very specific task. And they're just containers. So what does that mean? We get to shove them in a registry, and we get to take advantage of all the normal stuff that we can do in registries with security, and we can use that to move stuff around. And we also have the ability to go ahead and import from a variety of different systems, including taking native uh, OPA policies that you may have already created, stuff from Gatekeeper, what have you. We can just go ahead and import those and run those as is. So how do policies work? So I've got a cluster here. I've got a couple different policies defined in Warden now. What's going to happen is a policy is enforced when it's created, updated, or deleted, right? So it's only when a change happens that we're going to enforce a policy. And there's a reason for that that we're going to talk about in a minute. So what's going to happen is I'm going to go try to do a task. It's going to check to see if it passes the policy. The policy is going to process it. And then there's a couple things that that policy could do, right? It could accept, reject, or mutate. Now, what do we mean by mutate? Earlier, I talked about only wanting uh, containers that are signed in my environment, right? This is a great example. I can search and see if you're using, you know, some Python base image that I don't want you to use. I could swap that out and have you grab our BCI Python image that's solid, that's secure, that's locked down. You know what I mean? So you can do those live swap outs, live changes of whatever you want um, as you go. And we have two different modes, which is really cool. We have a monitor mode, in which case, when something is wrong and it doesn't meet the policy, it's going to notify you but let you let it happen. And then we have a protect mode, which when you turn protect on, that's when it's going to actually do these uh, accept, reject, or mutate. So you have uh, control over that. Now, I said it only happens when it makes a change to Kubernetes. Um, that's important. Because think about this for a minute. What we don't want to do is put something in place that says, OK, you can't run a container as root, right? Common thing that we're going to do. But the 
problem is Andrew back there three months ago released a container that was as root that's running a web server that we use internally, right? The problem is this stuff is only processed live as you go. So what is going to happen to his container when he reboots it? It's running fine. Everything's great. We put this in place three months ago. He reboots it. It's going to all of a sudden not be able to be recreated, right? Because the policy is going to be enforced. It's going to say, hey, this has root policy. I'm not going to let it run. So what we've done is we've just come out with a new capability. And what it allows you to do is not only run these at execution, but also go ahead and run them against existing containers just to get a list of the containers that are going to be hit by that policy and how they'd be affected. You're not actually going to apply them in place because you could have catastrophic things. But catastrophic? That's not even a word. Catastrophic. Dude, it's late. Um, you could have catastrophic things happen. So what's nice is we can produce a nice list of all the running containers, how they would be affected, and then you go make a choice as to what you want to do. Right? Do you want to fix them? Do you want to reset those containers or what have you? So lots of different options. Wow. Um, an example, and this is the key. I'm not going to get into this. The key is, dude, that's just Go code. Anybody who writes Go sees that and can totally see what's going on. I got the exact same thing here with Rust code. There's nothing special. This is a mutate call, but it's very, very easy. Anyone who codes in these languages is going to have a no problem doing it. We also have the ability to just directly go and compile your existing OPA and uh, gatekeeper stuff directly into WASM. A policies. And then, of course, we have Kubernetes integration, right? This is our cluster administration policy. What's cool there is that allows you to set up policies that apply to the entire cluster and then namespaces under it. You also have the ability to create admission policies, which allows you to assign a user to do policies just to a specific namespace, right? So you can either assign stuff cluster-wide or to specific namespaces. And of course, we have integration with telemetry, right? So you can directly integrate with Grafana, with Prometheus, be notified when you're having problems, as well as integration into Jaeger. And we're going to finish in two minutes, no problem. Uh, as well as integration into Jaeger, right? And here's one of my favorite things. Um, I'm not a developer. I don't code at all. I like to say I don't program in a lot of languages, which really means, like a lot of us, I can open up somebody else's code and tweak it a little bit, but I don't like coding directly from scratch. I like taking existing stuff. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about Cubewarden is there are now over 35 policies sitting up on Artifactory that you can just go grab. And it's all the existing PSP stuff that was already in there. It's already stuff like what I was saying with the um, SIG verification on containers. There's 35 of them already pre-done and ready to go that you can just grab, tweak, and modify. Sweet. And because of time, I'm not going to go through the install. But the key is, uh, if you're on Rancher, it's point and click install. It's just an exten uh, extension for us. If you're not on Rancher, it's like three commands, right? You install cert manager, and you do a Helm install, and you'll be able to play with it. Um, we will, at the Rancher booth, we will have some people who can talk about Cubewarden if you have questions throughout the week. And I'm looking in the back of the room to find out if we have a CNCF uh, Cubewarden booth here or not. You know, I'm looking at you, Robert. I, okay, I thought someone from Cubeborn was actually going to be here, but cool. And I ended right on time, exactly on time. Any questions before I go drink beer? I have one question. Sure. Okay, so now does Cubeborn, and if I have a dozen Kubernetes clusters in the company, Sorry, like, you know, if I, if I have multiple Kubernetes clusters in my company, like dev, pre-prod, prod, and geographically distributed production environments, then will I have Kubewarden installed in each Kubernetes cluster to manage it? You, you install it in each cluster to manage it. You're going to be able to obviously share the configurations back and forth and whatnot. It's because it's just containers sitting in a registry. So real easy to share back and forth. Any other questions? He, he, he's actually uh, someone who developed, developed uh, 
All right, so for if you're writing your own policies, there's SDKs for all of the major languages to write the WASM in, and there's also documentation and scaffold pro template projects that you can get started. So you can just do almost a one-click install and go. Yes, it did. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but I can get that later. So, so there are there's quick starts, there's videos, there's all sorts of stuff to make it super easy to start to consume this stuff. Cool. Any other questions? If not, thanks. Beer. Beer. Yes. Thank you.